Hello, I'm Clark Moreland, and today I'm visiting with Dr. Rebecca Day Babcock, who is the William and Ordell Professor and Chair of the Department of Literature and Languages here at the University of Texas at the Permian Basin, and we're here today to visit about Dr. Babcock's research. Hello, Rebecca. Hello, Clark. Um, Let's we'll start with a question about sort of uh, your research about writing centers, which is uh, where a lot of your research has centered over the years. Uh, it's largely centered on how writing centers are constituted and developed, and I was wondering if you could describe for us, please, your ideal writing center. What does it look like? Who constitutes the community? How does it operate in your mind? Uh, well, I'm glad that you said community, because I really think writing centers can be anywhere, not just in colleges and universities. That they can be in secondary schools, they can be in elementary schools. There's actually writing centers now in corporations, in banks, and other kinds of corporations. And there are community writing centers. Several communities have writing centers for the general community. So I really think writing centers can be for anybody, not just for college students. In the book that you wrote with um, Sharifa Daniels, Writing Centers and Disability, you write that because writing center theory appears to be concerned with individuation, it seems appropriate that we study different kinds of students and the different ways that they learn. For someone not familiar with writing center theory and individuation, what do you mean by that? How would you explain mm -hmm. how writing centers and disabilities specifically kind of go hand in hand? Well, the program of writing centers, the reason why we like it so much is because it, it is a one-on-one -on -one thing. Most writing center interactions happen one-on-one -on -one, or possibly in small groups rather than in a classroom where you have one teacher and all these students who sort of have to you know, teach to the middle, they say, and you can't meet each student individually where they are. So what makes Writing Center so special is that the, the two people are meeting one-on-one -on -one and they can gear their interaction to each other and they can modify the way that, that they're interacting depending on what the person needs. So the way I look at it, a Writing Center tutor, let's just call him or her a tutor, okay. has sort of like a bag of tricks. Um, different techniques to try. So if I'm working with you, a certain technique is not working. You know, whether or not you have a disability, but different people learn differently, we all know that. So I may try one technique with you, it doesn't work. So I go into my bag of tricks and I try another one. And that's the adaptation that can happen one-on-one -on -one that really can't happen when you're in a classroom with 20 or 30 people. Right, right. Um, has there been any recent research done on writing centers where people serve as tutors or directors even, uh, in addition to having students or, or folks just coming into a writing center with disabilities? Have you seen any research about where people are serving with disabilities? That's something that we call it for in our book. When we first put the book together, we had a few writers who had disabilities, but they didn't want to come out. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to declare their disability because of fear of discrimination. There's actually really one very sad chapter in the book about a writing center director who, who got a head injury, and for that she was forced out of her job. Oh, wow. um, and, it's, and it's a very sad story, but there still is a lot of discrimination. But finally, one of the authors of the book decided, at first she didn't want to come out, then she changed her mind and she said, you know what, as part of this program, as part of this thing we're trying to do, I'm going to come out as a writing center director with a disability mm -hmm. to sort of inspire others to not try to pass. Because we have, uh, also in another research project I did about uh, demographics of writing center directors, a lot of people with disabilities like um, ADHD, mm -hmm. depression, anxiety, these kind of hidden disabilities or bipolar even, right. it's easier to pass. And so they may just try to pass at work mm -hmm. for fear of discrimination or maybe people might treat them differently or treat them with kid gloves and they don't want that kind of treatment. So what we tried to do with our book, we have people with doing first person narratives there's a tutor with cerebral palsy who writes about her experiences working in a writing center. And, and recently, actually one of our alums here from UTPB, Melissa Elston, wrote a first-person account of working as a professor, a writing center director with a disability. So I think um, we have to start with these first-person stories. Mm -hmm. And you and I, yesterday, we were talking about stories. Um, it has to start with the first-person stories. Like, I'm, I'm a person with this kind of disability, here's my experience. Right. And then we can more systematically try to study what that's like, but it's hard because so many people are, are trying to pass mm. because they just don't want to have to deal with discrimination. That's a good segue into what I was wanting to ask you next. Uh, in your other book, uh, Researching the Writing Center, which you wrote with Therese Tonus, you make the, a very strong argument that research about writing centers and, and really writing studies in general needs to be empirical in nature. 
Um, why is evidence-based research such an imperative for you, in your mind, uh, for advancing this field? Well, actually, I've thought a lot about it, because <laughs> we're on the second edition. Um, but what we find is that people's perceptions of what they think is right, or their sort of common sense, doesn't always match with reality. Mm. This, there's a great, a perfect example of this in the research about required visits. Now, there's a lot of lore in writing centers that you shouldn't require people to visit the writing center. Mm. Like, I guess for those who aren't familiar, as, as professors, as instructors, sometimes we'll require our students to go to tutoring, and that is very controversial in the writing center field. Yes. They believe that you should not do that. But when we look at all the research, all the research has found that it is better when you require people to visit the writing center. Mm. It's actually beneficial. Um, the students have a good attitude. They come back. They improve. Um, all the sort of bad things that people are afraid of that are going to happen with required visits don't actually happen when we look at research. We see that it's actually beneficial. Mm. So that's why I really think that we have to look at research. And, and another one that you're probably familiar with is the research about grammar. Mm. Um, people in the early days of, we're drilling grammar, you know, we think more grammar you get, the better writer you're going to be. Right. But all the studies have shown that the more grammar you get, it has nothing to do with your writing. Right. So, and, but common sense, that goes against common sense, doesn't it? Right. Yes, it does. <laughs> the more you get, the more you should be, the more you right. should be able to do it. But. Same with English and bilingual education, which is another passion of mine. Um, common sense says that the more English you get, or target language, the more target language you get, the more skills you're going to be in the target language. Mm -hmm. But if you come by my office door and you look on my little graph, a chart I have on the door, actually shows that the more native language that you get, the more skilled that you will be in the target language, which that's research that goes against common sense. So, <laughs> so lore and anecdote or even stories, how is that different from, say, the kind of empirical mm -hmm. uh, research-based evidence that you're looking at mm -hmm. uh, with, uh, with, with your book? That's very good. Um, because stories like we value stories we value lore we value anecdote but like with the research on disability stories are beginning their way in and then we look at the stories and we we want to design a research project that can either validate or refute the sort of trends that we're seeing in the stories and the same with lore like isabel thompson and colleagues they did a study um, about writing center lore so they took all the tenets of writing center lore and they researched empirically to see mm -hmm. which ones were actually true. Um, for instance, one, one aspect of writing center lore is that we need to make students comfortable in the writing center. Mm -hmm. That was verified by research. <laughs> but some of the other um, aspects have been, okay, I'll bring in another one, not from writing centers. There's another lore that says, don't write with the red pen on the student's paper. Don't bleed on the no. paper because <laughs> the students don't like that. But Cindy Johannick actually did a study with students to find out what color they preferred teachers to write on their paper with, and it was red. Oh. So a lot of times that's what we have to question lore, and we have to verify or, or disverify lore with research. But I don't believe in tossing lore out altogether. Lore does have some value, but we shouldn't, it's like folklore, mm. it's, it's lore. We shouldn't just accept it wholeheartedly as truth. Right, that's great. Where do you see, as you look at writing center research, which has burgeoned over the last 10 years or maybe even 20, where do you see it going in the next 10 years? What are some of the uh, ripe areas, burgeoning areas for research that's going a, that's forward? That's a good question. Well, recently, uh, you're familiar with the Laura Salem interview that came out in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which a lot of people in writing centers were shocked because the, the, the interview in the Chronicle framed it as she was doing something radical because she was doing quantitative research. But um, writing center research isn't that new because even back in the 1930s and to the 1950s, quantitative research was being done with writing centers. Mm -hmm. And it was mostly survey, it was mostly uh, demo, kind of demographic surveys of what are you doing in your writing centers. Like one of the most famous early studies was 1950, um, Robert Moore. He surveyed uh, writing centers, writing labs, writing clinics, they were called back then, mm. across the country to find out how they were staffed, what their, what their program was, what their curriculum was, which is much like what, not exactly what Lori Salem did, but it's not a new thing. Quantitative research is not a new thing, but I think maybe in the future, maybe we will see more quantitative research as writing center researchers become more comfortable yes. with quantitative research. 
but we, we still like our descriptive studies. And, and I actually did a, I did a small survey of most recent kind of articles in the Writing Center Journal, and there's a lot of analysis of text. People really like to do that mm. because, you know, they come from literary studies. Sure. They're very, very comfortable with analyzing text. Mm. So that's probably going to continue as a trend. It sounds like you're saying that uh, writing center research sort of acts on a pendulum, that it moves back and forth between quantitative, empirical, and evidence-based, which of course is not just quantitative, but moving back and forth between anecdotal or even like qualitative or mixed methods, that as we go uh, maybe from a modernist to a postmodernist, and now whatever we're going into this next phase, that maybe we're moving back on that pendulum, back towards more quantitative kinds of research. Possibly. I, I can't predict the future. <laughs> But, but for a while there in Writing Center Research, there was a lot of anecdotes. Um, maybe in the 70s and 80s, right. it was a lot of anecdote. Here's what we do in our Writing Center. Or I tutored a student, and here's what happened, and here's what it felt like, and here's what we did. Sure. But, but you and I were just at the four C's, and we saw a lot of people telling stories and telling anecdotes still at, at a national conference. So I guess people, well, one of my other loves is, is folklore and discourse analysis. And in, in both of those fields, we look at stories and help people make sense of their life through stories. It's just a human thing that people do. We like to tell stories. So I don't think stories are invalid or bad. I, I like to hear people's stories about their teaching, don't you? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we can, can learn a lot. Yeah, we can learn a lot from stories. But evidence can also correct some of those uh, yeah, invalid verify. assumptions or verify. One last question for you. Um, it's not uncommon for compositionists and writing studies scholars in general to collaborate with other scholars, but you seem especially fond of it. Uh, both of these books you've written with fellow colleagues, and of course you've also collected and edited several works. Uh, could you talk a bit about how you came to write books with other scholars in your field, and just generally what that experience was like? Okay. Well, I believe in collaboration because I, I think it's one of the tenets of our field, and it's something that our field is based on, as opposed to literary studies, which is a solo act. Mm. But I, th I think in composition and in writing center studies, it's really a collaborative type of atmosphere, just the first right. thing we talked about, working together right. in small groups of one-on-one. -on -one. Mm. Not just by myself, you know, the kind of the romantic ideal of the single author. Mm. So um, how I got started with Writing Center to, and Disability, I was put on this team for the International Writing Centers Association called the Disability Task Force, and we were to write a disability statement. Mm. Um, so it was Sharifa Daniels, it was James Enwin, Beth Rapp Young, and me, and we, we looked at a, a statement, like a mission statement or some kind of a statement for the IWCA for the disabilities. And one of the things we came up with was the lack of research that there was in disabilities. So we wrote into the statement that the IWCA would foster research on disabilities. Right. It would include disability in tutor training materials. We thought that was very important because there's this, um, there's a trope in disability studies called the add disability and stir, <laughs> or the week 12 effect, where we have this whole course, whether it's about tu training tutors or any other thing, and then, oh, this, today's disability day, here's disability, get it done, and now it's over, forget about it. So we wanted to see disability incorporated. Uh, there was also a book, um, by I'm not gonna call him out by name, but there was a book uh, by another Writing Center scholar and an article where disability was not mentioned at all and it was about identity. Every other kind of identity was mentioned, but not disability. So we, we critiqued that heavily, and as a result of that, we brought out this book, <laughs> Writing Centers and Disability, where we mixed the, the first person narratives like we talked about, research studies, and studies of programs, how programs incorporate disability into their entire program mm. and how they, how they do that. So we're very happy to have this book come out in August, and we hope that people can use it in their tutor training. But I think it can work with training of all kinds of teachers, not just tutors. It's great that you're, you're seeing sort of your practice in the Writing Center and also your practice as a scholar sort of inform each other as you're thinking about collaboration as a way to learn in both areas, not only in the Writing Center with a tutor, but also among fellow scholars. Oh, yes, because we learn a lot when we put these kind of books together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think we're out of time. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Babcock, for your research and for your time today. All right, thank you.